Okay, so hi to whoever is still here. And like, I'm really glad that the last talk was faster because this might be a little bit longer. I have like 28 slides to go through, so let's start like this. No, okay, sorry. Yeah, okay, so I, I tried to put my whole CV in there, but it didn't quite fit. So hey, I'm Mirek. I actually like studied economics and I was working for a bank when I met a friend who's actually watching from the next room because apparently the chairs are more comfy in there. And he was like, hey, I started working at a game studio and we have a lot of data and we don't know what to do with it, want to try it. So I switched to Jiva, which at the time was super small. There was like 20 people. I was the first data analyst there. And over time, like we managed to like grow. So I hired three more guys. I built a data analytics team there. But after some time, I decided like I just don't want to do the dashboards and that. I'm more interested in basically the business parts of, of the company, the product and stuff. So I switched to a product manager role. And like, yeah, my biggest achievement is I ran the life options machine for, which at the time was top 200 grossing. We had like almost 2 million USD per month. So that was pretty cool. Right now we are building a new game and I would like to share something we learned from like both the old game and the new one. So a little bit about Jiva. It was uh, originally a flash based company that was building pool games for Facebook. But then there was this huge pivot where like not us, it was like them because I joined a year later. They tried to build Smashing Form, which was basically a fantasy pool game for phones. And now there's a project we are calling Smash Arena, which is basically the next evolution in there. We have like a very small slice out. You can try it out, but it's like five days of content. We are mostly using it to test and learn more about how users interact with the new game mechanics we are adding there. Like, yeah, Smashing 4 was the biggest hit that Jiva ever made. Like, it was actually originally never meant to be successful. Like, the company was bought and sold by some external investors and they wanted to make some money. So, the goal was just make a quick game, like, make it make, make some money. And, like, then he will sell it and it, it, it will be fine. But it exploded and quite a lot. Like, over, like I think the data is from a month ago. So we had like 15.2 million unique players and we made over 50 million USD over the time the game was running. So no one ever expected the success, which unfortunately created some issues. Because even though on paper it looked amazing, there was a lot of problems under the surface. Mostly, as I mentioned, Smashing 4 was never built like to last. So the technology there is like super outdated. And whenever I try to ask the Developers, basically, if we want to try to build this new feature, how long would it take, do you think? The answer is usually like a year. So there's massive tech debt, like the architecture is monolithic, and it's really hard to actually develop new features for the game. As we were succeeding, we also like scaled up too fast. We went from, I think, the 24 to like almost 80 within a year, which led to basically having too many cooks in the kitchen because suddenly there were like 17 managers and everyone wanted to have a say. And we were like scrapping features and like, are we more casual, more core, more mid core? Yeah, there was a lot of discussions. Plus, there was like an unfortunate, like, it's like company mismanagement that since Smashing 4 was a huge hit, like everyone suddenly thought that we were right once, we will be right again. So we invested, I'm not even going to say how much money into like development of a new game that was supposed to be like the next big thing. It was like a real time pool game for six players. And it was supposed to be an eSport and 3D and super cool. Like, I think no one's surprised it didn't work out. And, but it took us two years to realize that. So something had to change. Like for us, luckily, we were acquired by Eplavin like 2.5 years ago. With that came like new knowledge. So they helped us a lot. And there was a huge shift in the company culture and mindset. We again scaled it down. Like, at the time, it was like to 30 or 40, and there was a huge switch in the whole company culture. We tried to do, do things a different way, and we are start. We started doing something we call like the outcome-centric approach, and I will talk about what that is in the next few slides. So, yeah, just like a recap of what had to change, and this is how it worked at Jiva, and I think some like a lot of the companies back in the day were doing it the same. The team at Smashing 4 had like 20 people. 
and it was like very like uh, discipline, uh, like divided by disciplines basically. That like the process was that the designer team, like they designed the feature, there was a complete design document, which was then handed to the producer. He planned the work, he basically decided like, yeah, we will need like this many artists, this many developers. Then we actually delivered the feature. Then it went to the analytics team who did like a report. Yeah, feature was great. It made this much money, this impact. And it was presented to the stakeholders. And then we were doing another feature, which basically led to us having a very long roadmap with several features planned, which kind of depended on each other, which was sad because we have a feature that was like supposed to be great once we deliver this another feature. And like in combination, it'd be perfect. But like it's like the inside joke. I think I have it on one of the slides. It's like a feature we couldn't, we promised it by summer. And as you are saying, we never said which summer because it was in 2020. Yeah, so that's what had to change. These pictures I kind of borrowed from one of the like agile methodology things. And the first one is the typical description of an agile process. I'm not really going too, too deep into that. What's important to us was the second one. It's basically how we are now building the teams that like each team has three stakeholders. Like right now on the game, we have two feature teams. They are working in parallel, but each team needs to make like their own decisions. The structure is flat, but there has to be like the three voices in the team, which means like whatever we decide to make has to be usable or we call it desirable, which is basically the game designer's job. His only job is to try to make the game as cool for the players, as much fun as possible. And he like in this model, he doesn't have to care about like how much business value there is or anything. Then we have like the product manager, e.g. me right now, who has to care about this other side. That basically my job is to make sure that whatever we end up building is going to make us as much money as possible. It will not break any of the economic systems we designed and it wouldn't break the game. And then we have the lead developer who's basically responsible for making sure that anything we decide to do is going to be feasible, that it wouldn't take us two years to finish the feature, we could deliver it in a sensible time, and it could interact with everything else. What it actually means, I like to write a lot, so I will try to explain it, but there's a lot of words on the next few slides, so sorry in advance. So yeah, we applied something from Agile, and we try to like port it to fit the game development more. And like no more we discuss what features are we building next like we are actually starting from the business goals which there's like one use case i will go through because this all sounds very theoretical and i think it will be way more understandable once i actually show it on some examples so high level yeah first you set the business goals then you identify outcomes you need that lead to those goals determine the opportunities then as a team, we are trying to like make way bigger like team ownership. So the whole team actually participates in brainstorming and tries to find the best solutions to the problems we have. And then you actually build something. I will really expand on this on the next few slides. So yeah, this is the first use case and it's our legacy game, Smashing 4, where we need to be really careful about what we want to do because as I said, like the estimates are crazy. There's like a lot of things we cannot do anymore. So we have to really think hard about making as big of an impact as possible without investing all of our resources. So yeah, game has been running for five years. There's massive tech debt. And even though the player base is slowly declining, there's still a very loyal like core audience that's basically playing the game every single day. I think what led to this is the game is PvP and there's a big like community focus. So these people stay and we really want them to stay and we want like them to be happy for staying. So the goal we set as a company is that we want to stabilize our revenue on the values of from July 2022. There was a second goal, which was like, we still want to produce content for our engaged audience, but I will just focus on one goal now so that it's totally clear. So yeah, we first want to look at the specific outcomes. I'm not sure if these are readable or not. It's just more for illustration. If it's readable, then great. But like, it's always impossible to find like one outcome that would actually make life better for every single player. That's like where data starts to come in first because you need to understand who actually makes up your game. So that's when you need to get some segmentation, like whether you have like some fancy machine learning models that like do clustering or just like basic rule-based segmentation, which is what we used here. And yeah, 
then you evaluate each outcome on two axes, as we have here. One is the potential value. That's basically just like predictive modeling. You like, especially in this case, we have five years of historical data. So if you want to estimate what of an impact a feature or anything will have, it's kind of easy for us. We just look at the historical data. We model it based on that. And the confidence basically says how confident we as a company or the stakeholders are that this outcome would actually make sense. Yeah, so like the like small yellow ones actually say, let's just like what segment it is. So like this is like active non-spenders, this is new users, active spenders, etc. And the outcome is like a specific user behavior that changes. That like for the new users, we want to make sure like that like some percentage of them will make the first purchase. Like these are very generic. I think I didn't update with the new ones. Sorry. Yeah. So once you decide on an outcome, basically just like going right back, yeah. Like most of the time, just end up picking the outcome that has like the highest potential value that we are confident enough in to like decide to go for. Once you decide on an outcome, then you basically look at opportunities. These we identify as a specific problems the user encounters, or you can go the other way around. It's just like specific user behavior you want to incentivize. So like if like our outcome is that some percent of users will make their first purchase. We are actually asking the users, like, why are you not purchasing something? Because we are like, sending you all of these nice offers, and for some reason, you're not buying them. So what is the problem? And certainly, South is a collaborative effort. We basically try to pull in the whole team and try to like brainstorm as many like opportunities that we have there. So yeah, looking at this, basically, people are not paying. Like, Smashing 4 has one big issue. Like, I think I had to talk here like two years ago, and I was super nervous. But one of the issues was that the value for money is not there anymore. Like Smashing 4 kind of borrowed the whole meta game from Clash Royale, which was cool. But like the progression curve is super exponential. So if you need like a thousand cards to level up at level eight, you need like hundred thousand cards to level up at level eighteen. And yeah, so if it costs five USD to buy a thousand cards, it's really easy to sell to sell those cards to you for the first week. It's almost impossible to sell those cards to you after a year because they literally mean nothing to you. Then like all of this, all of these, we basically again like sort. Like someone from the team introduced like this thing we call the impossible zone, and the clan versus the inside joke. That's like the feature we promised to deliver by summer 2020. Like it will never get there. It's like we are like halfway there, but apparently like it will never happen. And yeah, basically all of these all of these solutions that we are going for are like estimated by effort, which is mostly like done by the tech test squad who like will try to estimate how difficult it is, how many mandates or story points or whatever your company is using, it will take to make them. And again, value is predictive modeling that these like solutions are like almost features. It's like very easy to like imagine what those things are. So we are trying to like model the uplift they would bring to the game. So yeah. I hope it makes sense so far. Like just a lot of pictures, sorry. Yeah, to recap. So what happened so far is we know what we want to build, just like going back to make sure. Like it's usually if it's in the happy zone, we are basically building it. If not, like we have to more investigate it. Like for these things, we know the value is there. We want to make them, but like the effort might be too high. So usually we first have to go through some form of discovery process, which I'm not going too deep into. Basically, we want to make sure that we can deliver it and that the players really want it. So we finally know what we want to build. Like this process usually takes like a week. So actually it was surprising for me because like the first time we tried this kind of process, we were just talking for a week in a room with the team and like not delivering or coding or working. But somehow, I think it's mostly because of the increased engagement that like all of the developers were, pa were part of the discussion. So it wasn't like we told them to build a feature, but they like know like why are they building it, what are the goals. Like they just managed to do it in the second week of the sprint. So even though it sounds like crazy, I would totally recommend trying it out because just like involving your developers more makes them be way more efficient. And we are also as confident as possible that our players want it as well. Like, I'm not a game designer, so I'm not going super deep. We are using several mechanics to like make sure that the players actually want this thing that we are mocking. So we are like doing some surveys. 
you usually do some mockups of the feature. We like show it to some audience. We have some community ambassadors on Discord, or we are running Playtest Cloud, which I think was also already mentioned by Vuga. And through those, we just want to be sure that like before we start making it, that there is some desire in the audience that they actually want this feature. Yeah, but at this point, we still don't know like if building whatever we decide on is going to help us reach the goal. And the goal is still the most important thing, and we want to learn it as soon as possible. So this is, I think, just like very small slice. And the goal, not the goal, like how are we going about this is that first we plan out the whole feature. Like, if we know the feature, we basically like, this is called user story mapping. I think most of you heard about it. Basically, we are mapping the whole feature from the point of view of the user. And once that's done, we basically determine the MVP. That's just, that's just the things that without those things, the feature would never work. And everything else just goes below the line. Because like, if it's above the line, we should be able to build it in a sprint. If we can build it in a sprint, like the next sprint we will release it to some audience, we can measure the data, and we will immediately know if there is some value of it, or if there's literally nothing. For that, we're preparing a validation plan, which is basically just like putting down all of the like numbers and hypotheses that like this should satisfy in order for you to move forward. So I'm just using the segment names there, but basically, yeah, this was the validation plan for the new purchase thing. So since we are targeting the users who are who are, I think this is the non paying players segment. Yeah, it's active and free to play. So at least 8% of users in the segment will make a purchase for it to be feature. But we are still talking in context of the outcome. So we need to make sure like the uplift is really coming from that group. It's not just like the part of your audience that the whales that will just buy anything you show to them. So yeah, also 20% of those, if they made the purchase, they will make a second purchase within two weeks. And since it could possibly cannibalize a season pass, like users that are in the season pass buyer segment would not stop buying the season pass. Because if, it, if they do, we didn't create any uplift. We just like shifted some people around. And there will be like no revenue per user decrease in the active payer segment. So this is just like a plan. And once we have data, we compare them against the plan. We see how it works. We either like keep the feature, we scrap it, or we do more iterations on it. Yeah, so now I have three use cases from the new product, which I think I can talk like more about, because that's the one I'm working on right now. And I will try to go through them. They usually showcase like how we try to use the process, what went wrong. Because it's always more interesting for me to learn about what actually went wrong than people just like showing, yeah, this was great. So the first one is I think from like this spring. And at that point, we only had like one very linear game mode in the game. You basically just had like increasing difficulty of stages. You were beating like AI controlled enemies and there was nothing else. At that point, we were going after like 25% D5 retention. I'm always just saying on target audience because sometimes we test on like different user groups just to be for it to be cheaper or more efficient. But we are always comparing on like the target audience, which for us is mostly like males in tier one countries, since the game is mostly mid-core RPG squad builder. And we are, so we went to the process and we were looking at the outcome and we went that we want to like increase like the positive, the positive or meaningful interactions with metagame. And this one like basically shows what happens if you just like let the whole team go crazy and there's like no mediation. So we pick the opportunity that Currently, the metagame systems provide no novel experience, and we would like them to provide some. There was the whole team brainstorming, and this is kind of what we got. There were certain like, things that had like literally no connection to the whole like squad building RPG thing. There were like, ideas from other games. And like we tried to like encourage the whole team participation, so there was zero moderation on this one. But yeah, what we learned here, it's still very important to keep to the three pillars so that we should still like be very firm on like making sure that whatever we decide to build has the company value, player value, and we can actually build it. So from this, we actually got like a memory mini game in the game. So like the whole game was a squad builder, but then you like pressed a button, which I think was here, and then you got to like a completely different memory game mode. And it was interesting because we released it. 
beat. And yeah, we luckily had some validation plan, which for this was that since we built, built it and it was the only alternative game mode at that point, the goal was for at least four out of five people to actually try it out and play it. And that the hypothesis was that players that engage with this would have higher engagement. Like engagement and mostly at this point meaning time spent in game per session. And players that play the mini game would have higher, five percent higher D2 retention. And in the end, we got this, like 87% of people actually played it, so that was great. On the other hand, engagement and retention both went significantly down, so apparently something didn't go right. And so, yeah, we had to go deeper. Since this, this team was super small, there was like eight people on the team, so I had to do the data analysis myself as well, so yeah, it's kind of a lot of work. I had to like give tasks to myself. And basically what happened is that some players really liked it. Like just the chart is like the funnel of a new player experience. So the main game mode basically had like stages, like going from one to seven. We are excluding one and two because that's the onboarding and you can't really make any choices there. But yeah, like originally like the people, the funnel was like linear, but now we, after 1.5, we introduced the alternative game mode and then the number just dropped. So I was looking into the user paths and try to understand what actually happened and isolated like three biggest like patterns that were there. The first one just like tried the game, they lost, tried again, lost, uninstalled, never came back. It's like we realized that like in the PvE genre, like players do not like losing and they do not like losing in like especially game modes that they think that they couldn't win. But what was more interesting was the other one that they actually really liked it. Like it had limited entries because you had to get the entries by, beat, by beating stages in the normal game. So they were playing until they just ran out of the entries and then they realized like it's not really a memory game, it's an RPG. And then they uninstalled. So, and the last one was I think the most, like the worst outcome for us. They tried it, they won. It was spitting a lot of rewards at the time, but since the game had very little content, they super quickly realized like how little content there is in the game and that they like already tried everything, so they left. So we ended up scrapping this, but like from doing the deep dive in the data, it helped us learn a lot. Like it was still like a bad practice in the way that it didn't really have the business value. It was just like, we wanted to see like where the team would get and this is what it led to. And there's like another use case, which is replayable content. It was, I think one, one month later, there was, so there was still the same goal for the team. And the outcome we had was that 95% of our players are progressing towards like obvious short-term goal, goals every session. That there is some other goals than beating the next stage in the linear progression. And the opportunity was that players can progress towards collecting a specific hero every session. So we were again brainstorming solutions. And this is for me a good example that like if you include the whole team, even though some of the individual solutions you might get are not really that great by, by that great by themselves. By combining multiple of those, you can get like something that's better than the sum of its parts. So there was like a lot of solutions that didn't make sense on its own, but then we completed like we combined like four of those and we actually came up with something that made sense. So like we actually made the stages replayable. We did what most other games do, that like you could collect some hero shards to unlock heroes. You could preview like what heroes you collect where, and we like built like a whole metagame system around this. Yeah, this is again how it looked. Like it doesn't mock up by our UI artist, who is honestly very talented. She can do like a million of these in one day. And the validation plan was that at least 80% of players that stick around for five days will replay a stage. And there will be at least 5% increase in engagement for those players. Like there was one glaring issue that we didn't notice at the time. And that's like at no point we actually taught the players that they can replay the stages. So that's unfortunately what happened. That like this is like the group we were analyzing, and like half of the players never find out their three plays. So they played for a long time, but they never figured it out. There was like a whole new currency that you needed to replay a stage, and they were hoarding the currency and they never figured out the use for it. So like on average, it was kind of fine. Like the increase in engagement was huge. It was like 20% but it was driven just like by those few people who were replaying stages all the time. Like those few people had like five hours in game per day. So for that very small subset of the audience, it worked, but for no one, like these players never figured out how to replay a stage. 
Like luckily within the spirit of doing the least amount of work for the biggest outcome, we fixed it in the next update just by adding one more daily quest, which said like replay a stage. And after like players knew that the option is there, they finally like were able to find it, find it. And the last case is like it's called blessings, but actually it was about something slightly different. Like the goal here was to get like retention to 50% on D1. And like we almost succeeded. I think with this update we got it to like 48 point something. So we are close. And yeah, then like by then we, we were analyzing the first day, like the, the FTUE and the whole like first day user path to understand. And the outcome we were going for is that less than 5% of players churn after losing a stage. It's like the worst behavior for us is our players really hated losing, but like it wasn't that like after they were losing, they would like do a retrospective and like figure out why they lost and try it again. It was just they lost and they never gave it another shot. So we really tried to make that go away. And the opportunity, the team that was doing this, this was actually the other team that I was working on, decided to go with like the opportunity that players will have options to change loadout of their heroes. Like if this doesn't scream like introduce gear to the game, like I don't think anything else does. But as we were trying to build the minimal slice, it actually looked way different. So this was like a super quick prototype. It took the team like a week to get to make it complete. And the plan was we A-B tested this. And in the group that actually has this option enabled, at least 25% of players that lose will try again and just like change the loadout. Like the blessing wasn't like, it wasn't like gear. It was like very, very prototype gear. It was like for the whole squad and to give you like some options. We literally designed some levels to only be beatable if you use the right one. Like e.g. there is enemies that poison you and one of the blessings literally was like cure your heroes from poison. And the churn would be lower compared to control and then people would actually use it. So after clearing the first 10 stages, so I think stage 10 was the first like hard blocker that like if you didn't use the blessing, your win rate was like very little, would switch at least once. And this is how it went and yeah, it didn't went that great. So looking at the charts, the first one is basically uh, the dark line is control and the blue one is the blessings. Like the obvious spikes are like around like the 110, 120 and 130 where we like introduce the specific levels. This is like how the win rate looks like, look, look, look like. So people were just like losing and leaving the game. So from that point of view, this was a total failure. Like, but we wanted to know why, because like just knowing it was a failure doesn't tell you enough. So again, like we were digging into the data and find out that more than half of the players never actually switched the blessing. We just used the first one never switch to anything else. And even if we managed to like make some players switch once, so they like, they went, got to 110, they lost, they realized something is wrong. They switched to like the anti-poison loadout, but then they never switched back. So they just used the anti-poison loadout, even if there were like zero poison enemies in the next 20 stages. And the, what it came to is players did not really enjoy the additional step before match because like, I think in like the typical squad based RPG, like everyone played some definitely. Like you already have to like build your squad and like adding some other like layer on top of it didn't really go that well with the players. So in here, I still think that the outcome and the opportunity was correct, but the minimal slice we chose was probably wrong because like players do not really enjoy the like changing your gear loadout before every stage. The typical gear implementation is more like the set and forget. Just like you collect the legendary sword and shield, you pick it, you, you put it on the hero, and then you forget. And I think I'm almost at the end. Yeah, so I think this is the second to last slide. So trying to recap like the message I was trying to get across, even though it might gotten lost in me talking about random stuff. Like the ultimate goal should always be to bring value to both the player and the company. Because in the end, like the players are who pays us. And the adaptation of this player-focused approach helped us to just focus on high-level goals and not specific features. Like we are not discussing in the meetings, like should we build like feature A or feature B? Should we do like PVP or something else? We are discussing like if we want to like get players to like spend 10 more minutes per day, what is the easiest or fastest thing we can actually do to get towards that? It increased a lot the, lear the learning of the whole team. Like we are holding the whole team retrospectives and reviewing the impact of all the changes. So like all of the like graphs and things I had in the presentation, 
are basically taken from those. So the whole team goes through it, and we under we try to like explain and understand like what exactly was wrong and what can we do better in the next sprint. And to drastically increase engagement and ownership of teams and and especially every single member of the team. And I think that's it. Yeah. Uh, we have some, of course, time for some questions. It's not uh, easy because it's you know it's late already. Uh, someone uh, like any questions to to Mirek? Maybe I will ask okay, uh, how long it took like the whole process to to kind of implement it and then have kind of refine. Like, I'm not sure if we are completely done. It's like we are still learning new things. We are not like completely 100 percent. Like, yeah, it's a process. Like just getting to the state where you can like produce new content as fast as you were like within the old one, it was like four months. Thank you. Okay. I actually have one question. Did you maybe try, you mentioned at one point, I think it was the case number two, with, when you tested mini game, uh, did you try to test it on top of the funnel also in UA and then to try to, you know, increase the, the inflow of, of the audience to go for wider audience and then ultimately to you know, get more players for less money inside, even though the average engagement in the early funnel will fall. Yeah, like, yeah, I think the idea is sound. We never tried it. It's more that like the, we did like some, uh, sorry, player base and like persona analysis. So like the players we want to mostly get, like this is not a feature for them. So I agree, it would make definitely like the, the reach bigger, but like those players do not really resonate with the core game we have. So we didn't see like the point in trying to like acquire them more cool i mean it was a great example it just for what for what made me think is like you still advertise on the stores and in the ads if you run paid advertising for the, at that moment you still advertise the same game yeah so people come and try the mini game within it or what you said actually when they realize it's not the mini game but it's the core game they still churn but they still on the app store they saw was the core game so that's why like but it's a hard question. It's hard to explain these things. It's just what like, yeah, like I, I totally know like where you're going. I think it's interesting. It's just like not something that we prioritized. Cool, cool. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Mirek. Okay. Thanks. Uh,